Gracie said. Um, I heard that he threatened probably some sort of grave. You had to be here, but I'll talk to him afterwards and you know make sure you guys get full credit. Um, but uh, I do appreciate everybody coming. Uh, not that long ago, we were in the same seats as you guys are sitting in right now, and that's why we're here. We want to share our experiences. Um, I'll just start very quickly by, um, this is a picture uh, of Dante from 2011 at Science Rendezvous when he was an undergraduate physics student. And we were exactly where you guys are at. And now this is a picture from earlier uh, this year. Uh, that's me in San Francisco when I was doing my medical physics uh, residency interviews. So we're just going to kind of talk about how we got from the left to the right. And without wasting much time, let me tell you why we're here. And it's to just share our first-hand experiences. So we're going to be talking about undergrad, graduate, and residency. And to also give you guys some advice, uh, things that have helped us through our studies and would hopefully help you if you are considering a career in medical physics and research. And that's what we want you to take away from this, is we want to give you some idea of what uh, the alumni have done from this department. We're very, we, we think very highly of this of that department. Uh, we might be biased because we, we came through here, but uh, we're going to share some examples of how UNS or physics has given us an advantage and has prepared us in the future. And also, uh, just talk about careers, research. We're going to talk about some of our um, research projects, and uh, that's always fun and interesting to hear. So uh, basically the outline is, uh, back then it was physics and high technology. Is it still called physics and high technology, the degree? It might just be mm -hmm. physics, but we had, there was a medical physics stream when Dante and I went through it, and we did co-op. So medical physics stream, physics and high technology, and co-op and thesis research as well. And then we both did a PhD at Western University uh, in London, Ontario, in the medical biophysics department. Great department. Happy to answer any questions about that. And then we've gone through the American Associations of Physicists in Medicine, the Medical Physics Match. That's a group of, um, of medical physics um, uh, in, in the States and uh, very, uh, very important. And uh, then we're doing our residency at Stanford and UCSF. So that kind of brings us to uh, our From the Rose City to the Bay title. But I want to make it clear that during the NBA championship, yeah. we were <laughs> Toronto Raptors all the way. So I'll pass the floor to Dante, and he'll uh, continue telling you guys more about this. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. So, uh, like Tommy had mentioned, um, we went through what was physics and high technology or physics with uh, a medical physics specific focus, and we also did the co-op stream thesis. Um, and I just took this from the website. It was still up. It was from 2008, and Dr. Rangan was on there, that brochure that he gave out with medical physics. And this was kind of the outline back in the day. And I'm not too sure if it's still the same, but co-op was staggered throughout every other semester. And it gave us a really good opportunity to get exposed to research, and specifically with medical physics, um, as well as different things like we did a thesis. Or I did a thesis with Dr. Mayev. And there was an outstanding scholar program that allowed you to work with some of the faculty around to do some research as well, which was a great opportunity. It really made us stand out among the other applicants who were going through grad school or applying for grad school. On top of that, there was the volunteering experiences. So like we showed on the first slide, we were involved with Science Rendezvous. That was a Rubens too. I don't know if, even though it's still around, maybe, oh, you yeah, haven't tossed that. OK, that's great. <laughs> so it's a pretty cool experiment if you guys ever have a chance to play around with it. Uh, there's the physics club downstairs. It's still here, hopefully. The little room, maybe. But, uh, oh, you got a better room? Oh, wow. OK, that's impressive. Hopefully, the Nintendo 64 is still there. That was pretty good. Uh, so yeah, we had volunteering experience. And then on top of it, something that was also unique was we were given opportunities to actually do team ships in undergrad, which was also like it stood out when applying to graduate school. Um, so my research, like I mentioned, I did co-op and thesis, and I worked directly with um, Dr. Mayev at IDAR on a few of his projects. One, which I started back in 2010, after my first year of undergrad, was this device, this percussion device to detect pneumothoraces. Um, before coming into undergraduate, I did work, like, uh, I was at Sandwich Secondary doing this robotics course, uh, and we would have to do AutoCAD design. So I took that knowledge that I took in my high school experience into undergraduate to do this sort of design and development. And we built a prototype device. It was kind of a little bit of a hack job back in the day. It was a little bit rushed, but ended up generating like signals uh, to detect different things like pneumothoraces. But this is actually a signal. So when we were developing, there's a few other uh, alumni, Anish Dar and Ann Moore, a few 
know him, well, he was probably was around here very shortly ago. Uh, so we were just testing on each other, just playing the device and reading up the signal, doing a Fourier transform on it. Following that, I did a few more co-op terms with Dr. Maiv. This is a better and improved device, and actually testing out phantoms to see if we could differentiate different resonance within the, these sort of materials that we had. And just developing some uh, algorithms, uh, some coding, uh, sort of uh, these harder skills like uh, computer science and programming that were needed in the future. Um, did a thesis and did some finite element analysis uh, approaches on these devices to check out the resonant frequencies, which were important when we we're analyzing the spectrum, and actually like modeling the torso and things like that to really decompose those signals we were generating for our device. Uh, I also had an opportunity to work out west at the BC Cancer Agency uh, to work there and actually, uh, so here, uh, some of the medical physicists in the back have probably seen this multiple times, but this is a cathion phantom to analyze the image quality of our CT scanners. So I got involved in just developing an automated approach using MATLAB to actually analyze these images, uh, which was funny. So when I was interviewing last year and talking to some of my old supervisors, I actually phoned up Dr. Bazran, and they're still using this program that I built many years ago. So at the time, I didn't think it was that useful, but I guess now it's still being used. I don't know what's taking it, but uh, all in all, so this is you know a synopsis. Yeah, it's, it's really fun talking about the lungs and imaging, but what I got out of my undergrad and the really things that were important was I got exposed to medical physics, so being in the clinic, but I also got to be exposed to this research that actually set me up in my future graduate career. And I'll talk to you in a little bit about that. Yeah, perfect. Um, so before I get into sort of my research experience during undergrad, uh, a theme that you'll notice throughout this talk is that we like research, we're really passionate about it, and uh, the undergrad research experience that we got here uh, was uh, excellent and it really made us stand out. So how many of you, maybe by show of hands, uh, is doing co-op? Anybody doing co-op? Awesome, co-op. How many of you are doing research? I don't know if outstanding scholars is still going on, but you can definitely volunteer and work it out. So everybody's doing research. Um, research projects are always really interesting, but starting early on will really kind of um, get you going. It's uh, You have to learn a lot of new things. You have to pick it up. Every lab is different, and that's what we gained out of it. Starting earlier on really set us up for graduate school if you're thinking about that. So uh, my first co-op term where I started to think a little bit about research and I was exposed to the clinical physics side was at Windsor Regional Hospital uh, with Luke and John there. That was, uh, uh, that was the first time uh, I even really got into the clinic and I was looking at shielding calculations for a LINAC bunker and neutron flux through the maze of a LINAC because during radiation treatment uh, when the beam is on, um, the neutrons are produced from the high Z target that's, uh, that's inside the LINAC. So this was this was great. Uh, really piqued my interest in medical physics. I was already already liked it as a career option, but it was good to see what you can do. Um, and then I did two co-op terms at Triumph. Um, I hope they're still advertising Triumph positions for co-op with Windsor and getting there. It was a great opportunity. I worked for the Tigris project, which is um, which is a, a large detector spectrometer that's shown on the right over there. And the beam line comes in from the right, and the experiments are done right at the center there. And then all of this shack here are the electronics for the spectrometer. And if you were to open it up and look inside it, you would see all of these detectors that surround the chamber where nuclear experiments are done. And my job was to take these detectors into a lab, calibrate them, play around with them, see what's going on. You know, I started working with cesium-137 sources. I know Dr. Racy has them now in labs. Before, that was the first time I had seen them. Um, electronics, uh, digital acquisition systems, data acquisition systems, you know, amplifiers. You learn all about these things. These are great to be exposed to early on. I didn't know what a preamplifier was. I didn't know how it worked. The playing around with it was great. Then you produce results like this, where you, you're looking at these detectors. They have, um, they have complex geometries inside it. And by doing these experiments, we could understand how they uh, how they behave, and uh, because you know, I, looking back at it, when I was in Vancouver, I should have probably taken more advantage of the scenery around me and gone out more. But you're there, you're like, let's do. Like, we're at this research lab, so I was like, I'm gonna learn Jayon four. I'm gonna learn some Monte Carlo simulation. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so this is a video from a Geon 4 simulation of this exact experiment that we did. So right from the get-go, you get some programming experience, you do some nuclear physics, you really get to see what it's like to work in one of these big research labs. And um, I'm not showing results from these simulations because I did not produce any results from these simulations. And they would probably be wrong. But it was really, that experience was, was great. I, I, still, I still think about that work now. As you can see, we dug up some of our old slides from our co-op presentations. Um, so you can you can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, signal processing is what really uh, the uh, Triumph exposed me to, and um, and basically using these simulations, I was able to contribute a little bit to the science there. So it's it's really nice to be involved and in the research opportunities that are provided here at Windsor um, because it'll kind of keep you motivated through all your studies, through all the things that are going on in your life. Um, doing these little research projects, they're fun, they're exciting. You get to you know, get your hands in there. It's not just theoretical physics that's on the board. It's not just, you know, quantum, statistical mechanics, but uh, that stuff is very important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But these, uh, these research experiences are great. And then near my fourth, um, near the, the, the last year of my undergraduate research, I started looking at collaboration. So this is an EEG system, and this is with um, a psychology professor from the department here at Windsor, Dr. Lori Buchanan. And they had an EEG system, but they weren't using it because nobody had set it up. So I went in their lab, and we set it up, and we were looking at concussed athletes and seeing if we can detect any EEG signals from them. And because of this, um, their EEG research has started to pick up. And I you know, started working with IDAR and Dr. Maya when we were looking at building these EEG systems. So we started manufacturing you know, how to, these headsets, that wireless EEG systems. But the important part isn't really developing the system. It was the collaboration project with Dr. Lori Buchanan, who had the, the EEG system in the psychology department, Dr. Chris Hebert, who was looking at concussion, and Dr. Roman Maya, who had the signal processing background. And this is a lot of what research is in the future. So, you know, starting to do this and branch out into different departments, you can really see the impact that physics brings in science. And with that, I'll pass it off to Dante to talk a little bit about graduate school. So, following that theme, we just talked about that we're going to be talking about our graduate experience. So, uh, I defended my PhD almost a year ago, or more than a year ago, I should say, uh, at Western University. And it was dealing with lungs and imaging, kind of following that theme of my undergraduate. And the title of my thesis, I actually forgot it. Uh, I had to look it up today. But it was Imaging Biomarkers of Pulmonary uh, Structure and Function with Dr. Grace Perrigan. And before I get into actually the research that I was focusing on, so the degree itself, uh, a little bit of advertisement on that, it was a combined PhD and MSc, where the master's was more course-based. You had all these courses that you had to take for campus requirements, just listed here, that I also took from the website. Uh, but so. We did the PhD at the same time simultaneously, which allowed us to focus on our research. Uh, but also, again, going back, we were involved in some TA. Uh, a cool, unique opportunity that Western gave to us was called a QA ship or quality assurance uh, internship, uh, where we actually worked with the medical linear accelerators up at Western, uh, at London, um, to get us again exposed to these clinical linear accelerators and what we need to do in the future. Uh, and then another opportunity that we took advantage of was uh, buying our, uh, allowing us to go out to the research community at these scientific uh, meetings, so like AAPM or RSA. Uh, so jumping into kind of a little bit of my research, so for lung imaging, uh, imaging lungs do, does happen, and it's mostly towards using computer tomography or CT, where you can create these really beautiful pictures of the lungs, knowing um, where the airways are, where different disease locations happen. Uh, and it provides you with really good structure. But unfortunately, it doesn't really tell us a lot about the functional lungs, which is you know, sometimes more important to know. So what we were developing at Western was using MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. And anybody with MR research or knows about MR, there isn't a lot of protons inside the lungs. So they actually appear as these black holes. So we're actually getting less information with MR. But one of the cool things that we were developing is the use of this hyperpolarized noble gas MRI, where, uh, in short, we made this contrast agent that we allowed patients to inhale. And with a very simple breath hold and a very quick acquisition, we could just start generating these fingerprints within the lung of where disease lies and where, you know, potentially targeting therapies. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, the gas itself and this technique is quite costly, so it's very limited around the world. So my thesis, in short, was developing, trying to generate these images without having contrast, which doesn't make sense, right? So how do you do that? Um, so one way, and the idea is you want to take dynamic images of the lungs using our anatomical images that we have. And knowing when we breathe in and breathe out that our lungs expand and contract, that's a change in signal that we can see within inside our images. And knowing that change could dictate whether or not you have disease or not. So here is called parametric response mapping. And the idea is, again, looking at a specific voxel or an area within inside the lungs and seeing how it expands and contracts and plotting them all on this uh, joint histogram plot. And we use these separations on the X and Y axes to basically differentiate what has disease versus what doesn't. And you can start now identifying regions of disease without having used the contrast. And what we did was in this cohort of uh, patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we actually took images using uh, the CT approach, but then also our MR approach. And what we wanted to do was seeing if they would co-register or if they lined up uh, nicely. Uh, another technique that I was developing is this free breathing, again, dynamic anatomical imaging, where we were looking at free breathing MR. Uh, and what you could notice is if you were to make these images all the same, which is called registration or image registration, and if you looked at a single region within side the lungs, you saw this oscillation because of this expansion and contraction. And by applying very, you know, simple Fourier transform physics like Fourier transforms, you can start identifying these peaks located at the respiratory uh, cycle or even the cardiac cycle to generate these ventilation and perfusion maps, so getting function from structure. And we applied this technique in many different patients, so asthma, bronchiectasis, COPD, and lung cancer. Uh, but one of the limitations on this technique was it's uh, limited to one slice or one location within, inside the lungs, but we're more interested in the whole lungs itself. So what we did was moving forward with this was develop a whole body approach. And again, acquiring images and doing some single processing, which going back to my undergraduate was what I learned, right? Was dealing with images and doing single processing. It really gave me a push forward to actually accelerate in my research. And this is just here, just a simple acquisition scheme. Talking about how, you know, now instead of using a Fourier transform, using the Hilbert transform that gives you phase information. And, you know, so now this is similar to if anybody's been exposed to 4D CT. Uh, it's called 4D MR. It's basically the same sort of idea where you're bending now those images into their appropriate respiratory bins. And really, the, the ultimate goal was to get them all synchronized. So this was what it was before, this is what it was after. Um, to get that expiration and inspiration image that I showed you with the CT before, but now with MR, to do the same sort of uh, differentiation of the signal intensities. And again, comparing it with our healing versus uh, these free breathing approaches, we saw similarities uh, in different groups of cohorts. So and the take home message was, again, we were developing these techniques so that it wasn't limited to just very specific research centers that we could translate this you know, to centers that don't have these sort of capabilities that were unique at the time, so that's awesome. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about my um, PhD research. Uh, so I defended my PhD uh, a week ago today, so I'm fresh out of grad school. Submitted my revisions on Friday, so um, anybody that's going through grad school, there's always this light at the end of the tunnel, and honestly, it feels great when you get through that. So. Um, I feel like that's a good motivator to uh, finish strong and to keep going. Um, and my research um, was also in medical imaging. Both Dante and I did research in medical imaging at Western. Uh, and Dante's were more, was more a little bit on the cl clinical translation and looking at patients. Mine was a little bit on the theoretical end, looking at x-ray detector design and how we can design future detectors to, uh, to be better performing. And that's what I'll talk a little bit about. So first, um, if we're talking about imaging systems, we have to get uh, we have to talk about some metrics, which you might be familiar with, and they will be Fourier metrics, not to mention Fourier transform. Except now it's not a frequency in time. When you think of you know 60 hertz or things, this is a spatial frequency, so it's a frequency in space. Um, 
And the reason why we use Fourier metrics, we're not just you know wanting to use Fourier metrics to use Fourier metrics, is because it'll allow us to describe an imaging system independent of the input object. So normally when you're talking about oh, how good is the SNR or the contrast in an imaging system, that will depend on the size of your object and on your imaging system. And when we talk, when we use Fourier metrics, we can actually remove one of those. We can, we can make it independent of object size. And then we can talk about things like signal transfer using the modulation transfer function, which I first learned from in Dr. Racy's class when I took medical imaging here. And uh, very quickly, uh, this describes the change in amplitude for different sinusoidal frequencies. So in the input, you would have different frequencies with a certain amplitude. The output, if the amplitude decreases, then your MTF decreases with frequency. So that's how uh, MTF is understood. Noise uh, is described by the Wiener noise power spectrum and um, WU. And similar to MTF, but now we're looking at variations of certain frequency inputs. So if, uh, if a certain input has a certain variation, standard deviation variance, uh, what is the output of that variance? And then we can map that as well. But what we really want, we want to know signal and noise, SNR. So what's used in X-ray imaging for SNR transfer is the detective quantum efficiency. And it's defined as this equation shown here, where we have the MTF squared divided by the noise power spectrum. And the reason it's defined that way is because it gives us a measurement of an X-ray detector's ability to produce a high signal to noise ratio image for a given exposure. So it's kind of like a surrogate of the dose efficiency of the detector. High DQE is good, meaning that it will use the uh, dose as, effect as efficiently as possible. Low DQE is bad. So these are some DQE curves of current clinical detectors that I measured uh, throughout my uh, PhD studies. An ideal DQE uh, would be one across all spatial frequencies, and that means that you're only limited by the Poisson statistics of the number of X-rays that are incident on that detector. But as you can see, these detectors are, are high performing. They're, they're expensive. That's what this is what uh, the hospitals buy. But uh, at low frequencies, the DQE for some of them is, is pretty high. It's 0.7 for that one at the top there. Um, and low frequencies are important for visualizing large structures, like if you're counting ribs or if you're looking at large uh, detail in, in general. But high spatial frequencies, all of the detectors, their DQE drops with high spatial frequency. They're less dose efficient at those frequencies. And those frequencies are important for visualizing fine detail, like uh, uh, small structures, discerning the shape of certain things. So at high frequencies, and, and those are crucial for early detection of cancer. And that's why, that's what's the motivation behind uh, improving these detectors. So um, a lot of work has gone into improving X-ray detector performance, but at high frequencies, it's still an issue. And a very quick illustration of that is if we look at a mammography image. So and let's say this mammography image was the input to our mammography x-ray detector. If the, uh, if the DQE was 1, the output would be exactly the same as the input. Okay? But because the DQE drops of this detector, a mammography detector, and if I show the output for this image, there was actually a change there, but you didn't notice it. And that's because it's in the fine detail. You really have to look at calcifications. You have to look at small structures to notice. And that's what radiologists are trained in. When they look at medical images, they're really good at not just looking at the overall image, but even zoning in and discerning these small details. So that's why DQE at high frequency is important. And um, my supervisor, Dr. Ian Cunningham at Western, he uh, has developed theoretical models of these detectors, and using those models, he identified something known as noise aliasing, which reduces DQE at high frequencies, and it's the primary cause of DQE loss. And noise aliasing, you know, aliasing is a misrepresentation of higher frequencies into lower frequencies. Noise aliasing is when that happens with noise, and which is even worse because now you're adding more noise, and that's why it hits the high frequencies more. So. What my research was, was taking a conventional detector, which as physicists, we can think of it as a black box with a converter layer and an electronic readout. And a conventional system has one element, one readout is equal to one pixel. To remove aliasing, the concept is a new. This detector that we're proposing is new because it does everything inside the design, but it's to have a sensor array that's much smaller than the final readout, apply onboard anti-aliasing, and now many elements contribute to one pixel. So, again, anti-aliasing has been around for a while. What really makes this design possible is the X-ray sensor technology that's being manufactured today. It allows for manufacturing of these very small sensors with very low readout noise, and you can implement this on the detector. 
Now, a quick illustration of the benefit that you would get with this design. Uh, I'm going to illustrate this here. So this is a, a webcam shot, a video stream from my, from my laptop here at the auditorium at Western University with all the lights off. So it's very dark, so you're quantum limited. This is what an x-ray image is. You don't want to use a lot of x-rays because then you're going to uh, increase the dose of the patient. And what I'm holding here is this uh, 2D uh, anti-scatter grid, not important, my friend Santiago let me borrow it that he built for his uh, research. But when you can see, when I hold it back, you can see the aliasing artifacts that occur because that grid is at a higher frequency when I move it back. You can see aliasing artifacts on my chain, you can see a lot of noise that's, uh, that's around the ceiling and the stairs. So if I do the same um, anti-aliasing algorithm with the AAP design, what we notice is that the aliasing artifact is completely removed from that grid, so it eliminates it because it blocks those frequencies. My chain doesn't look so pixelated anymore. It has a more continuous, it doesn't have those jagged edges. And as you can see, the noise on the ceiling and the stairs, that's been greatly reduced. So the idea is that we believe this could have an impact in medical x-ray imaging to discern those fine details. So we want to bring the same improvement there. And this is the technology that I was talking about. So for mammography, selenium is commonly used as the x-ray sensor, um, and that's because it has, uh, it has good properties for mammography applications. So they're able to deposit the selenium directly on a CMOS sensor, which is low readout noise, high resolution, and we want to implement it on the detector firmware. And um, the reason why you would want to do this uh, down sampling effectively because now you have a higher resolution sensor but your image size is bigger is to uh, reduce uh, file size so if you had a very small element um, image these high resolution the file size would be too large for clinical settings so in the lab we want to maintain as much information as possible we don't want to down sample we want raw data in the clinic that's a little bit more challenging so we have to so we propose a method of using that raw data on the detector and the output image could be used clinically. And um, a lot of my work was on the theoretical models of it, but the, the re I won't spend a lot of time on it, but what we can do is we can use point processes, um, and what that is is you can uh, model an x-ray exposure as a random location in space using direct deltas which you've seen those functions before if, if you've taken special functions. And then you can model how they interact in the converter layer, how they're blurred, how that signal is sampled, and then you can describe DQE expressions for a conventional design, you can describe DQE equations for other designs, and that's a real useful toolbox to identify bottlenecks in an x-ray system. And then we can we have a lab uh, set up uh, at Western uh, with an x-ray tube on the right and a detector on the left, and we can do experiments. And then we can even go further into a clinic and measure detector performance into a clinic, as shown here. And um, I have to sh maybe I'll skip over this. There's some, but we, we measured MTF for conventional AP design to show the improvement, and we measured DQE for these two designs. And we believe that there is an impact with the AP detector design. And it goes back to the whole premise of it that cancer detection requires images with high SNR for a given exposure. And this could result, the AP could result in reducing false negative rates in mammography, but it could be used in other fields, or it could result in reducing false positive rates in clinics without increasing the exposure to a patient. But the overall, I think, message that Dante and I are trying to get to you with our PhD research is that it trained us to be independent researchers, critical thinkers, uh, fail, try things that didn't work, argue with our supervisors about things that we did, that we thought would work, but didn't work. But at the end of the day, your supervisors are to guide you, so we always listen to their advice. <laughs> and um, and we, have, when we understand that the process is long and that they're there to help you and get you through these dark times. And then it also prepared us for clinical training, medical physics residency, and, oh, uh, <laughs> very quickly before I pass it off to Dante, um, in addition to the research, research can be long. Uh, sometimes it can be stressful. So you have to find things outside of the lab to kind of get you through it. A good way to do that is to be involved in the university, to be involved with extracurriculars. Here is Dante at Science Rendezvous uh, two years, a year ago, a year ago um, at Western. Uh, talking about uh, what, what was it, a uh, steam oh, engine? Yeah, I don't know. And uh, my friend Jessica. So we we still participate in Science Rendezvous. We still do. We organize card making. So for Valentine's Day, for Mother's Day, we just have card making. Uh, we have some equipment, and everybody uh, puts together some cards. Um, another thing that we do is we go to retirement homes. Uh, and uh, we talk about our research. So this is a way to present your research to the general public and, and a lay audience at, uh, at a very 
at a very basic level, and it's great. Uh, they they contribute in ways that you wouldn't expect. They ask questions that are very relevant to the news today. It's just uh, and. They have so much knowledge about things that you wouldn't think it would be worthwhile. But by being involved, you uh, you pick up all these things. So this is Dante presenting at these uh, these community centers. Um, we also organize a, a retreat at Robarts. So inside Western, there's a, a research institute, so Robarts Research Institute. Uh, we've uh, we've started doing this retreat there and continued it in the past. So this is Dr. Marlis Kaczynski. You remember her? Some of you. She was here at Windsor, and uh, she's at Western giving the opening remarks. And uh, also um, raised funds. This is my mom and my dad with uh, their dog, and this is at a Mother's Day walk to raise funds for breast cancer research. These are kind of things that you you can do, and they're very rewarding. Uh, sure, they take time, they take planning, but uh, I think it's worthwhile. Oh, um, I think it's my slide, right? Yeah. All right. So maybe maybe we'll take a quick. Um, does anybody have any questions? Since we're going to transition from sort of undergrad and PhD research. Does anybody want to ask? And then we're going to talk about medical physics residencies. Is there any burning questions about uh, graduate school or undergraduate school? If not, we can talk about it later as well. No? Should we just maybe just continue? Why don't we, uh, if anybody, take a break and get, just get one more bit of food and then sit down just so there's still chips and cookies and water and pop. So get up and get a second round of food and then, then we'll get back into it. How about yeah. that? That sounds good. When we measure the point spread function, yeah. we don't use a point, we yeah. use an edge. Uh, but essentially, um, you know, depending on where that source is within the pixel, yeah. that's what's going to cause the aliasing. So yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of trying to more accurately identify where the source is. Um, but sometimes bad aliasing is good, sometimes it's bad. So it's, um, and then we also, we didn't want to do any sort of advanced adaptive algorithms that would make it a non-linear system. So we wanted to focus on just a linear source. Yeah. So it, um, that was, I mean, looking at a lot of linear filters, it would be an interesting extension. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into the alien to the And nobody likes non-linear systems. Yeah. It's much easier. Yeah. 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 So I, I think I think before they resume, I will I will ask a question that I'm sure is burning in your mind, but you probably haven't asked it, which is of since we just got done with the graduate research type stuff. So of all the stuff you learn as an undergraduate at the University of Windsor, if it's possible, could you relatively rank the 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 contributions of like book learning, like the ability to solve differential equation that you learned in special functions or something, Fourier transform, the most important thing. <laughs> For sure. You heard that. How many times? You guys got to learn Fourier transforms. Or the research experience, which you got great things in, or the computers and numerical type things. So those are three very different things. So yeah. which, I, I mean, could you possibly rank them or comment on their relative weights for how you got and what you were actually using when you're there? It's like, God, I'm glad I learned this at Windsor, for example. Yeah, I'll, uh, I can go first. Um, so it, it, it depends on your program and on, on your project during your research, and your graduate research. Because my research was a little bit more theoretical, the, um, the book learning, the fundamentals, the, the courses, uh, special function complex, um, even like solving boundary value problems, all of those, that, that was, I would say, that was probably the most helpful for me. Um, then I would say computational methods. So if you're ever going to try to implement this, I would say uh, computational methods. And then the research experience, I was, they're all important, but that's how I would rank them. Um, 
Windsor does a really good job of when you leave outside of the undergrad, you have a strong understanding of the fundamentals. So uh, I noticed, and I'm sure Dante would, would agree, that um, when we are doing some medical physics research, not everybody comes from a pure physics background. Maybe they're engineering, but uh, a lot of them are with a medical biophysics undergrad degree, and they learn a little bit of everything, and they understand maybe um, the biology a little bit better, but the fundamental physics uh, contributed a lot to my, to my research. Yeah, just to echo what Tommy said, it's, uh, it's definitely noticing when I first got to Weston, I was taking courses for the campus how much above and beyond it was in regards to like just the mathematics that we learned, the, the bookkeeping, that, or the book work that we had. So, But I would rank my number one would be the computation, so that really pushed me above. So going to like PC Cancer Agency, doing these research experiences, but really focusing on like um, developing algorithms in that lab, or like LabVIEW, or any of the resources that are available, uh, really stood me out and really uh, allowed me to excel in my own research. Um, I would put second as the books. So books and learning was important, uh, specifically for the coursework. It really helped me uh, through, you know, even like my MR courses. There was uh, uh, some of the things that I even look back, and I remember looking at Dr. Racy's notes in his class, and always like talking about everybody, like everybody about Dr. Racy at Western. You should know this guy. He, he definitely helped me out with my medical physics learning. And then lastly, I would put research. But, uh, you know, again, I think all of them are just like key aspects. Like, I, you know, with the research, I can say that that helped me get into the PhD program at Western because my supervisor was focused on life and I was doing imaging. So that was kind of my background. And having that was a starting point to me to accelerate in my research. But, yeah, uh, that, that's kind of the ranking part. Yeah, and I want to make sure that this doesn't sound like uh, humans or physics has paid us to endorse them because they really have. <laughs> We're trying to speak as candidly as possible about um, about our experience. In graduate school, uh, a lot of things surprised us. I would say it wasn't it wasn't always smooth. So if you have any questions, we'll do our best to speak candidly. Um, and yeah, it's like you're you're and you're all doing research, which is great. But always keep in mind kind of what are the skills that you're getting out of. So understanding the fundamentals, the compute, the computational skills. You know, when you're interviewing in the future, it's not going to be as important that oh, I'm in Dr. Racy's lab. It's going to be well, what did you do in Dr. Racy's lab, and what can you do for me? So what are those things that you're learning throughout it? I think that's what we got. Yeah. So um, so I noticed that both of you did co-op as well as thesis. So what was the value that you found in doing the co-op? Um, because I mean, it was it was interrupting your. I mean, now our co-op uh, program has changed, where the students do a one year after third year, rather than doing interrupted semesters. But uh, what was the advantage that you found of co-op? Um, I would say you know the advantage for me for co-op was first uh, continuing on my work. So that was a nice opportunity to continue on research during and having these kind of breaks uh, between the books and then doing the research and focusing on that. That back and forth was really nice. It allowed me to regain focus when I went back to the books, um, which made you know that process much easier. Um, yeah, I, I would say it was that for me, uh, going back and forth, having a lot of experience. But also, again, like getting myself uh, immersed in the field of like the research and medical physics was really great opportunity and allowing me to be exposed to like things like the clinic, like industry, that maybe I wouldn't have had just if I did, I don't know, non co op path. So, um, but again, I can like maybe reinforce that like you can still see how these opportunities probably, you know, but co-op allows you to like facilitate a little bit easier throughout the academic. Yeah. And I, I agree with all of that and I would add uh, with co-op, there's a financial support aspect that I think all students are kind of weighing the, uh, you know, the cost of tuition, the uh, and how everything comes in scholarships that all comes into it. So um, I think that I would also add the financial support that co-op gives is a nice touch as an undergrad, and that um, and then everything else that Dr. said. I, would agree with. But, I mean, you went uh, to Triumph, which is an opportunity that you don't get to do in the co-op. Yeah, 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 definitely. And Windsor Regional Hospital. Like, uh, open my eyes to medical physics. Um, I wish I could do that co-op again. Um, that would, uh, that was, that was great. And those, you know, um, yeah, all, all those things. I think. True. There's another question here. Oh, I was just gonna ask um, when you're doing your research, say for your thesis, how much of it is independent, or is some of it like also collaborative with your advisor or other students? 
Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, that's a really great question. Yeah, it, you know, when you first get in, you, you know, people take different approaches for research. Some can just be focused on their own solo pathway, which is great. Uh, I can say myself, I took a more collaborative approach, not even like within my lab or my supervisor, but within other labs at the institute, at other labs, uh, at different institutes. Um, but you know, that's the thing. That's something that I I learned during my grad career was. You know, your supervisor is there to advise you, but there's this like opportunity where they allow you to be your own independent researcher at some times. Like, they'll see, they'll, you know, you may prove yourself and you, they'll give you the ability to see your own researcher. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it, it, it really depends on the person, and I guess it depends on the research, but I can see I took the collaborative side of things. Yeah. All right, well, we can definitely talk more about that after uh, we finish the last part of our presentation, and that's uh, a path to a medical physics career. Perhaps some of you are interested in medical physics, um, and that's what we want to talk a little bit about. And um, there are two streams, uh, radiation oncology or diagnostic imaging. Um, but uh, regardless of which stream you are thinking of, um, you're maybe you know, you, you're at a bachelor's and you want to get to a job as a clinical medical physicist and uh, a path to certification. So to get there, um, what you'll need to do is go through a CAMPEP accredited program. Um, it, it wasn't always like this, but now it's become more standardized, and that's what you'll be looking at. So if maybe you've already gotten a master's or a PhD in something else, uh, maybe you're coming into uh, a medical medical physics, not straight out of uh, undergrad, then there are one-year programs that will allow you to do the certification courses. Um, so that, that's a potential. There are master's uh, degrees that are CAMPAP accredited, and uh, you can do those. And there are also PhD degrees that are CAMPAP accredited, which is what Dante and I did at Western. And um, uh, either of these streams, and, and there might be other opportunities as well, but these are probably the most common. Either of these streams are to prepare you for a clinical residency, uh, which is usually two years, um, or you can have a clinical residency and what's done nowadays is combined with a postdoc, so uh, another year of research or, or more. So you could have a little bit longer clinical residency when you're doing research. Uh, so I'm doing the clinical residence for two years, and Dante's doing the clinical residency plus postdoc. And uh, the goal is to become a clinical medical physicist. So what you see is that uh, your, your education is kind of geared towards this residency position. And once you get that residency position, um, then you can um, apply for certification and become a physicist. So why do we need this residency training? Uh, the objective of the training uh, is to educate physicists uh, for the clinical tasks and the subfields are imaging, nuclear medicine, radiation oncology, um, and your and then after you finish your residency, you are an independent physicist that can work at a cancer center um, and do a lot of the work that a medical physicist does, like QA the machines, um, check off uh, on uh, on treatment plans, and complete those. I think your phone might be going off here. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a nice intro. Yeah, sorry, but I need to silence. Um, it's good. And uh, what I re recently went to is a residency interview. So after you do your graduate school, you'll have to interview and uh, get into a residency. And preparing for interviews, it should be. Um, uh, it should be done throughout your graduate training. I understand not everybody has that uh, that freedom to do it. Maybe they've they've decided later on, but you should be thinking about who your references are going to be. I mean, that's I think that's what we didn't touch on. Uh, our re your references speak uh, speak highly. They'll they'll if they speak highly, they'll open doors for you in the future. Um, it's the same thing with an interview process. It's also an invest an investment of time and money. So. It does take time, and there is a financial cost that's usually out of pocket to the applicant. So you want to make worth, you want to make sure that that investment is worthwhile, and it's a networking opportunity because this will often be the first time that these cancer centers that you apply to meet you, and that first impression is very important. So uh, you have to think of it even more so than just an interview. It's a, it's a, it's a first impression. So um, maybe you do or you don't know. There's a, a match system similar to. 
uh, medical school in residency for medical physics, and there are many openings listed in that system. Um, 80 plus uh, was this year. Uh, they're mostly American schools. There are uh, American uh, residency positions. There are some Canadian as well. Uh, and the, the whole point of the match system is to prevent programs from pressuring students to accept a position right away. So it is a system that tries to benefit uh, the applicants mostly, but also the programs that enroll, um, they also want a match as well. So there's a lot of information on the match system. And what I mean by a timeline investment is these are six months from, uh, so October is usually when the list, when the APM listings are made public, uh, the application opens, and then the deadline is usually at the end of December. Uh, and then what happens is in January, the applications will be reviewed, and then the interview process begins, so you'd be contacted for interviews. February, hopefully more interviews. Uh, this is when you'd have to travel. So for example, I went to San Francisco, San Diego, Cleveland, all of these mostly are out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and then in the end, um, there is a, a matching that opens, a ranking that you submit, and then the results, the results are announced at the end of March. Uh, so this is six months, but before the openings happen, you usually have to talk to your supervisor, you have to make plans. So I would even add another three months uh, in before October. And then after, the ma after March, you even have three more months for wrapping up your PhD or your master's or and then figuring out where you're going to go on next. So it's, it's almost like a one year process. So planning ahead of time helps a lot and um, not saying that you can't do this shorter but if you want to reduce your stress and anxiety uh, you definitely want to give yourself that time. And just a, a quick note that there are programs outside of the match uh, and these are most of the Canadian centers um, and you the uh, they have they don't have set deadlines, they don't have set uh, application opening dates, so you have to look at their website a little bit more frequently and check in on them, and you have to apply to each one of them individually. Whereas over here, you could apply to 20 uh, places, but you only submit one application. So pros and cons to either one, and uh, the answer that you'll often get when you ask, well, what's the best thing to do? It always depends on your situation. So that's why it's always good to talk about it, though. And I'll pass it on to Dante for residency. Okay. So, um so for the past year, I've been in my residency uh, in California. So it's kind of broken down really into three aspects, at least for my residency program, which is three years. It's clinical, didactic, and research. First being the clinic, which is the most important, and that's dealing with the quality assurance of the QA, like we had mentioned multiple times, of the machines that we use within the clinic, as well as some treatment planning. So here's just one of, you'll see this a lot. So these are the different machines that we have uh, in the clinic, so, but you can see in all of them there's this big tank of water which we use to actually do our quality assurance to measure dose distributions using our ion chambers. So we have the classic C arms, we have ones that are within the OR uh, where they'll actually irradiate the tumor bed after resection. And then we have this cool little thing called the cyber knife where it's basically, you know, on the automobile line how there's that arm that you have. They've mounted a linear accelerator ahead of it to actually do very targeted treatments. Um, and here's like a simple test. We put uh, a head phantom, uh, and on the tip of the nose is a little BB. And the cool thing is, inside the LINAC, there's actually a laser that lines up identically to the beam that you're shooting out. And we have this test, which is called the BB test. And we basically generate a plan to shoot that laser at the tip of the nose and see how well we can actually shoot it. So yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, but sometimes it's... You know, it's still fun, but, uh, you know, this is game six. I was actually, this is outside of the room of the LINAC. It's at the console, and I was actually watching game six while doing quality assurance one night. So, you know, uh, yeah, you still have to support Canada while doing your QA. Okay. So another thing is treatment planning. So here's uh, what a treatment plan looks like for specifically a patient with lung cancer. So you can see this color map, which basically tells you where the dose is being delivered within. And that very hot spot is where most of the dips is being delivered. And um, these models that we use, that we implement into our treatment planning software, allows us to calculate a dose distribution and plan for the treatment. And here's like a little, it's called a beam's eye view of the actual, where the Linux can be rotating around. And there's these little fingers called MLCs, or multi-leaf collimator, which basically manipulate or collimate the beam to basically shape around the tumor and to avoid critical structures while you're treating. So that's one aspect, which is developing these plans. While you're doing all of this, uh, on top of the clinical, you do your rotations. So again, taking from the website, uh, this is kind of the rotational outline of where I'm at. 
and you go through these different sections to kind of specialize in different areas. So one can be the safety, the Linux um, quality assurance. One thing can be dealing with specific procedures like brachytherapy or IRT special procedures or the cyber knife. And then at the end, you usually have this outreach where you go out and you're now kind of this independent pseudo medical physicist. And then there's full participation where you then become a medical physicist in the clinic. But while you're doing this, you're actually doing journal clubs and learning and teaching. And we have these things called task group reports, which basically dictate the way we basically implement our clinical physics skills in the clinic and basically guidelines for us. So this is a very famous one. You guys in the back probably know about TG51 and then TG142, which basically talk about the quality assurance of these medical linear accelerators and the sort of tolerances that we need. And then the last aspect is research, so going back home to all of that. Um, so they're mostly now focused on the clinical implementation and the improvement within the clinic. So, and also still and more uh, towards the basic side of research, um, where, you know, again, coming from my imaging background, what we did was that very similar plot that I showed you with lungs. We did it within cervical cancer patients where we were acquiring different images that acquired uh, different functional inf information within inside the tumors to actually start differentiating the tumor sub-volumes to maybe target those regions over others, so more focused treatments. Uh, other things are like going back, so designing phantoms. So this is a 3D phantom that we designed and using that 3D printer to build for more quality assurance purposes. And lastly, something that's always close to my heart is lungs. I love lungs for some reason. Uh, but yeah, so this is a little device where we're taking a, so right now in the clinic, the way you measure the lungs and actually gate your treatment is using this optical tracking system. Uh, and talking to some of the therapists uh, where I'm at, it's a little bit finicky with lining up the camera with the box. Uh, and it's kind of costly. So here I just implemented a little Arduino, which cost, you know, this whole setup was less than $30, which basically produced the exact same single traces that we could generate from this very complex system. So yeah, that, that's basically, um, the different aspects, you can jump into whatever, which one you want, but again, you follow your own path now. That's a nice thing. So you have all this knowledge that you gained during undergraduate, during graduate school, and now you can translate it almost as an independent PI. Those, most of those projects were basically solely on myself. I came to the clinic, and that was something I wanted to implement. And I was given that sort of like grace to do so, which was a nice thing. So there's, I don't know, if you're interested in research, it's a really cool thing to do. Yeah. All right, um, and uh, we're coming close to the end here. So we just have three points that are our take-home messages, advice. Um, it's what we use personally, um, and we find that it works well. And they're, you can tell that they're, most, they're always generic, but if you apply them to your research and your graduate career, um, they're, they're very useful. And sometimes you have to hear them over and over again to really appreciate it. So the first one is always to have a plan and always be working towards your goals. Uh, when we were undergraduate students, the plan was to uh, finish your courses, get high grades, and it was very structured. Graduate school is not like that. Uh, graduate school is a little bit closer to the real world, and uh, you are a little bit um, just more vulnerable if you don't have a goal that you're trying to work towards. So, and the other reason why having a plan is important is because it'll help answer all your other questions. Because then, um, and then the answer is, well, should I do this? Is it going to help you get to your goal? Then do it. If not, then maybe uh, consider that one again. So uh, taking some time to have a plan is always good. And I know that's not always possible. But I always start with that's number one. The next thing is you want to surround yourself with people that will help you achieve your goals. Um, so that's your supervisor, the relationship. Uh, one of the students asked about you know, how, uh, how that works with how much freedom you have. That depends on your supervisor, that you have to prove yourself. But uh, you want to make sure that you surround with people that if that's what you want, they're going to give you that opportunity. You, uh, and everybody has their own different style, so you want to make sure that you find the right people that you can work with. And then the third thing is you have to take ownership of your own work and success. Um, I think this is more of just a, a motto that will help uh, that most successful people have. Uh, but in grad school, it's really important. You want to make sure that if uh, something doesn't work or if something uh, happens, that you uh, not take responsibility in terms of fault, but that you make sure that it succeeds the next time and you figure out what's going on. And all of these I've highlighted your, and it's not uh, it's not selfish to want to do these things, to implement your goals, to follow your goals. Um, I think uh, that doesn't mean that you can't help others as well. Uh, so. 
uh, these three points, if I, whenever I think back, I've always sort of tried to do this, sometimes better uh, than other times. And um, we really like research, we really like physics, clinical work kind of allows us to combine all of those loves. Uh, but in conclusion, uh, and maybe Dante, feel free to jump in at any point, uh, you, Windsor Physics, prepared us by teaching the fundamentals. I would say uh, that's what, when you leave here, and if you are looking to more clinical, translational research, uh, the fundamentals are, are very important. The, the courses, the book learning, um, I want to give two examples that uh, it's, come in, it's, uh, it's come in handy for me. One was during uh, residency interviews. Um, oftentimes, you'll have fundamental physics questions. So one of the questions I had was, like, talk about brown strong radiation and uh, describe brown strong radiation, right? And uh, I was able to describe it to the level where I said, and they were looking for one particular sentence. They said, uh, I, well, I, I said, um, so it comes down to an, uh, an electrical charge that changes acceleration and will emit radiation. And that's EM theory that you'll pick up, right, that you'll learn here. And they were really impressed with that. And they said none of the other applicants even stated that. Everybody else, well, breaking radiation, it comes from electrons with high Z targets. But when you get down and you can explain something that's fundamental that way, that's what they were looking for. So there are these fundamental skills that you're learning, and the education is very important. And then the next example that I have was from Dr. Racy's course, where he made us memorize an equation that the energy of a photon is equal to 1240 kV <laughs> picometers divided by the wavelength. And my supervisor asked me, well, we're trying to figure out some coherent scatter experiment. So like, what's the wavelength of a 10 kV photon? So bam, quickly rearranged in my head, divide by 10, you come up with an answer. And uh, that was really impressive. So things like these, these little helpful things, um, that's what kind of just uh, stands out to people. And um, everybody knows you can go back and kind of figure it out. But there are certain things that you have to have ready on the go. And as clinical physicists know, you don't have time to go and write MATLAB scripts and figure this stuff out. There's information. There's certain things that you need to know. Um, and then medical biophysics prepared us uh, in terms of the research. Um, and exposing us to communication and clinical opportunities. So going to conferences, being able to speak about science, it becomes more and more important the further you go on. So that communication course that everybody has to take, that everybody dreads, you just want to do physics, you don't want to talk about this, uh, that amplifies. <laughs> that just, they try and, uh, you have to learn how, you, I, the writing is really important. When you're writing a manuscript, all of the stuff that we're like, we're going to go into physics so we don't have to that stuff. That's the stuff they want you to do more. Like writing grants. It's writing like, grants. Uh, being able to tell your story. Oh man, I've heard that so many times. And it's still weird as a physicist to think about story and science. Um, so we share, I think, those common feelings. Uh, maybe Dante, you want to mention something about the fact that we did imaging research and now we're in radiation oncology? Yeah, so I, I think that's something that uh, stood out while I was doing my interviews was that um, we did imaging as our background. It kind of brought a, a little bit of a twist to uh, the radiation oncology side of things because that's where, you know, therapy is going is image guidance if it's not already there. But moving that forward, now you have these combined MR Linux, these different superpower machines that actually deliver radiation very precisely. So it gave us a really strong backing because that's kind of what they're looking for is having this kind of diverse background. But we also had those things like during our uh, graduate studies, like the QA ship or, or you know, the research at the different cancer centers uh, to actually look at the Linux as well and be around those as well. So, so diversifying is really important. And then uh, the clinical duties and responsibilities, uh, that's what residency is supposed to be about. Um, combining it with, if you like research, um, Medical physics is kind of this really nice spot that you can do clinical research, a variety of different research. Mine is more theoretical. I hope to continue my PhD research during residency. But you can also have that clinical training. You can also have that job, right, that everybody like you, that you kind of, you're thinking about. It's all about balancing um, what you want to do with your career and thinking about your investments and making sure that you get the most out of it. Medical physics uh, has been really, I guess, good to us. It's, like, it's kind of been able to give us a little bit of everything, which is why we like it. And with that, uh, if you have any questions or any other uh, things you want to talk about, uh, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to discuss them more. Thanks. All right, maybe we should turn some lights on. So, does anybody have any questions? Thank you for the group. All right.